Without question, this has been a challenging weather-related week, but not just in the United States. I mean, I think we all know about what's happening down in North Carolina. People are dealing with what Hurricane Florence left behind, the remnants of which will find its way up here tomorrow. But on the other side of the world, the people of the Philippines and China are dealing with Typhoon Mancut with its 160 mile per hour winds. And then the revised death toll in Puerto Rico came out. Let's just say it's been tough all over. And so this week, we're thinking about all those who've been affected by storms. But of course, that's not all we're thinking about. Because we're also going to talk about what Jesus said to his disciples during the Sermon on the Mount. That's something we've been doing for the last few months. And as we move forward through these lessons and understand more about what we're calling kingdom living, we can look back on some of the stuff Christ has already said. For example, he's talked about how God is blessing those we don't usually see as blessed and how his disciples are expected to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And he told us how believers need to deal with their anger and resist immoral temptations, as well as how they need to strengthen their integrity and their generosity and their love. And he also taught about how we should avoid using our righteousness to win friends and influence people. And he applied that to our giving and our praying and our fasting. Now, that's what Jesus has already talked about in this series of lessons. And this morning, in the passage we're looking at, he shifts to another area that might cause Christians some problems. And right now I'm talking about how we can and should view our possessions. You know, the stuff that God has either given us or given us the ability to earn. Now, that's going to be our focus both this morning and next week. And as we start looking at, as we start looking at what Christ had to say, again, we're going to ask ourselves three questions that will sort of guide our discussion. According to Jesus, first, what's the problem we all face? Second, why is this a problem? And third, how can we deal with this problem as we try to live as citizens of heaven's kingdom? Now that's how we're going to approach these verses. And I'll tell you, as we begin thinking about the problem itself, I believe Jesus was very clear and, and direct about what it is for them and for us. Just listen to what he said. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now in a nutshell, that's our problem. You see, all Christians, which includes us, of course, face the same choice. A choice in terms of what they're going to value. And I'll tell you, I think the nature of that choice is even clearer when we look at the passage in the original Greek. Because the word store up is actually the verbal form of the noun translated treasure. Therefore, we could translate the passage like this. Don't treasure for yourselves treasures on earth, but treasure for yourselves treasures in heaven. You see, right here and now, we have an undeniable, unavoidable choice. In fact, it's a choice we have to make over and over and over again. You see, on one hand, we can treasure, you know, value the treasures we have right here on earth. Of course, only a few of us have the incredible riches that Hercules and another Argonaut found in the cave on the Isle of Bronze. Let's face it, the stuff we tend to treasure, and I certainly include Ray Harryhausen when he was alive, is a lot more modest. You know, stuff like houses and cars, telephones and televisions, and of course, Playstations and Xboxes. Now, that's the stuff we treasure. And you know, often we treasure these things more highly than almost anything else. Let me show you what I mean. While I think most Christians would be willing to give their hearts and give their souls and give their lives to Jesus, I doubt that many would be willing to give their televisions if that meant unplugging it and hauling it down to goodwill. I don't think I would. You know why? Because I haven't. Man, I don't think many of us would even give up our cable. I'm telling you, our treasure is usually right here, right here on earth. And yet, all that electronic stuff isn't very useful in New Bern, North Carolina right now. 
And as I know from first-hand experience with my Mini Cooper, cars can sure burn right there beside the interstate. And you know, this was a lesson even Hercules learned in the movie Jason and the Argonauts. And I'm talking about when his theft of a golden needle from that cave we just saw, when him stealing that thing caused Talos to wake up. And trust me, he was one of the reasons they call it the Isle of Bronze, and it's a bad thing to tick off a bronze statue. But that's what happens when you're focused on a treasure right here. You see, on one hand, we can choose to treasure you in order to put a high value on earthly stuff. On the other hand, though, we can treasure things associated with heaven. But I'll tell you, as it's used in Matthew, heaven isn't really a place far away that good people see when they die. Rather, it's a reality that's present with us right now. And that's why both John the Baptist and Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of what? The kingdom of heaven has come near. You see, in Matthew, Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God. Therefore, at least in this gospel, the word heaven was used to identify God without using his name. And so treasuring heaven or God is a whole lot different from treasuring stuff because it involves placing a high value on godly attitudes and godly actions rather than on secular money and secular mansions. I mean, think about it. If a person truly treasures the things of heaven, I think he'll be working to develop the fruits of the Spirit in his life. And I'm talking about the kind of attitudes Paul lists in his letter to the Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I'll tell you, when compared to a PlayStation, these things will not only last, but will permanently shape a person's heart. You see, we're, you see we have a choice about whether we're going to treasure earthly stuff or heavenly actions and attitudes. According to Jesus, that's the problem we face. And you know, there's a very real, real and clear reason why making a heavenly choice is so important for Christians. You see, the choice we make will either help us focus on or distract us from what should really be most important. And I think that's what Jesus was getting at when he said, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, that's what he said. And I'll tell you, I believe this is all connected to the choice he'd already talked about. Of course, when he said I, Jesus wasn't suggesting we're like a cyclops. No, he's talking about both our eyes. And since for him, our eyes together is the lamp of the body, in other words, the windows through which the light that's inside shines out, our eyes can be either, according to the New Revised Standard Version, healthy or unhealthy. But I'll tell you, even though I like that translation, I think the good old King James Version is actually closer to the Greek. This is what it says. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee is darkness, how great is that darkness? You see, the Greek word translated healthy is used nowhere else in the Bible. And in Greek writings of the time, the word generally means single or simple or sincere. And the word translated unhealthy nearly always means evil. Like when Jesus said to the people who wanted to get him because he didn't do what they wanted him to do, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person brings good things out of a good treasure. The evil person brings evil things out of an evil treasure. 
I tell you on the day of judgment, you will have to give an account for every careless word you utter. For by, the, by your words you will be justified and by your, your words you will be condemned. You see, that's what the words actually mean. And I think that explains why this choice about what we should treasure is so important. You see, if we treasure the things of heaven, you know, the will of God, our eyes will have a single focus. They'll be simple in that they're not distracted, you know, going from one thing to another. In a word, they'll be sincere. And as a result, they'll radiate a single, simple, and sincere message to those around us. And that message will focus on those things we really treasure. You know, like love and grace and mercy. Using an image he's already used a little earlier in the Sermon on the Mount will truly be the light of the world. Now that's on one hand. But on the other hand, if we treasure all those earthly things that come and go, things that rust and decay, stuff that moths eat and thieves steal, then our focus is going to be anything but focused. It's going to be all over the place because we'll constantly, we'll be constantly replacing the stuff we've lost. And as a result, we're going to become distracted from being the people Christ has called us to be. In that way, our eyes will be evil because our values will be all screwed up. And I'll tell you, that's a real problem. Because if this is what we choose, not only will we not radiate light, the only thing that will come from us is darkness. And so according to Jesus, those who treasure the things of God, they have a single, a simple, a sincere focus, and they'll radiate light. But those who treasure earthly stuff, they're going to be constantly distracted by all kinds of temptations, and they'll be drawn by all kinds of values, and they'll end up becoming these little walking, talking black holes. And that's why the choice is important. And so how can we make the right decision? In other words, how can we move towards treasuring the things that are eternal rather than the stuff that's temporary? And how can we develop a focused vision and leave behind constantly changing values and opinions and emotions? Well, I think Jesus gave an answer in the last verse of this passage. He said, no one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Now that's what he said. And personally, I think that's really important for us to remember. Because I've got to tell you, when it comes to what I treasure, you know, what I value, man, I'd rather straddle the fence. I mean, even though that's not always comfortable, I'd much rather believe that I can value earthly treasures as well as heavenly treasures. You know, the stuff that breaks down as well as the stuff that lasts forever. And I'd much rather think that I can have a single, simple, sincere focus of, on God and his word and his will right along with a broad and a changing perspective on the world in my life. You see, I really want to believe that I can be God's slave and do those things he's called and equipped me to do, but also have, let's say, a part-time job where I can get some of the other stuff I treasure. Now that's what I want to believe. But as Jesus reminds me and he reminds you, that's just not possible. In fact, I'll tell you, that may be one of the reasons bigamy is illegal in our country. Because we all know that a man can't serve, what? Two masters. Unlike successful negotiations and an ideal compromise, what we treasure just can't be a both and, rather it's an either or. Therefore, like it or not, we have to decide, is what we treasure on earth or in heaven? And will our eyes radiate a single, simple, sincere beam of light, or will they be darkened by distractions and confusion? You see, right now we need to decide what we're going to treasure, what we're going to value, what we're going to seek out. And by making that decision, man, that's how we start to do it. And you know, in a way, that's sort of like what people facing a hurricane have to decide. You see, when the storm's coming, they can focus on safety. And they can focus on it like a laser beam. The, their safety and the safety of their family. And if they do, when told to go, they're going to do what? They're going to go, right? They don't have to think about it. They're going to pack up the car and go. 
Or they can try to protect their stuff by staying, right? And then they'll have to stock up on all kinds of food because they're not going to be able to buy it when the hurricane is blowing. Maybe even a generator. They'll have to do something about their windows because if the windows blow in, boy, you got a problem. And they still have to keep track of the storm because it may be worse than expected and then they'll have to go, then they'll have to go anyway. That is, if they can, because if they wait too long, the flood may swamp the car. You see, that may be a good example of both treasures and focus. And I'll tell you, we face the same kind of thing all the time. I mean, what's the problem? We can either treasure God or stuff. And why is this a problem? That's simple. What we treasure will determine what we reflect to the world. And how can we solve it? Well, it starts when we recognize that, like it or not, a decision has to be made. And so let's say we decide to serve God rather than money. That's the decision we make. Man, what are we going to do when the bills have to be paid? And the mortgage is due? And we got no food in the refrigerator? Good question, right? Well, that's what we're going to talk about next week. Amen.